start time. So um, Matt Stamper, I'm a CISO here at Evotech. I am absolutely thrilled about the, uh, the discussion we're about to have with Sandy Bird uh, from Sunray. And Sandy, I'll have you kind of queue up uh, your presentation deck if you want to go ahead and, and get that ready to, to share. And, and as he does, I, I think this notion of identities and really thinking what is different in today is critical. Too many of our security tools are effectively long in the tooth. They don't work well. Um, and we're facing new types of risk. And these risks really have uh, temporal, volumetric, any number of different considerations. And, and so I think we really do need um, new thought, new thinking to this. So without any further uh, delay, I'd love to introduce Sandy and maybe just a little bit about your background and then we'll jump into to what's going to be a fantastic discussion. So thank you yeah. for being here. Yeah, thank you everyone for for joining us and and Matt and I have lots of topics to discuss with you. We've uh, we've prepped a few uh, kind of starter slides as a backdrop for us to have a, a conversation. And uh, you know, my background um, been in security for twenty years plus. Uh, you know, it's always interesting how people get into security. I had to make a choice: was I going to do networking stuff or security stuff? And I made a choice a long time ago to do security stuff, and it's uh, it's paid off ever since. Um, I actually was the founder of a company called Q1 Labs in the security intelligence space uh, many years ago that was acquired by IBM and I was the CTO of IBM security there for uh, five years. And uh, back in 2017, 2018, I just saw this massive transformation that was happening as people were changing how they built applications, moving things to cloud, building infrastructure as code and realized that there just had to be a reinvention of how security was done here. And that's why we started Sunry Security. Um, so I spend all my time in security analytics pretty much all of the time, Matt. It's a uh, it's a great great fun great fun. So I love it. Maybe real quick, the derivation of uh, Sunray. Ah, so the great thing about uh, Sun it's actually Sunree, by the way. Sunree, my apologies. <laughs> um, but that's okay because no one else pronounces it that way either. But it uh, it is Gaelic Irish and uh, it means data um actually so it's uh it's kind of interesting if you're starting a company these days and you want to put data security in the domain name pretty much everything is gone so uh it's always interesting to uh to basically uh kind of look through that and say okay how are we going to do this and, and uh we have some uh some irish background in our company and uh so it was a good way to do it we used a slightly different language to put data in our domain name which was which was fun i, I love it Hope, hopefully as a scotsman you won't uh mind that i'm here on the call <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Exactly, exactly. Look, um, look, Matt. Let's open it up this way. This is kind of a, a neat intro. I, um, you know, again, I go back to that history back in 2017, 2018, looking at you know what we were saying. What's new? Like, what is? Why is this transformation so different than what we've done in the past? And it's actually not about cloud. It's interesting to talk about cloud a lot and being this big transformation thing, but it's not cloud. It's actually that we change the way that we build applications end to end. Um, you know, if I go back to my my history in uh, in IBM, I had um, very modern teams of development and very uh, mainframe focused teams of development, and we had development cycles from you know one team in the mainframe side was like eighteen month development cycles, and I had a mobile app that literally was reduced or producing code every twenty four hours, and so you have these kind of different worlds and. So the, this reinvention of these big monolithic apps that were built using waterfall to these very kind of microservice agile environments that are continuously changing, that in and of itself is a change in the way that we've built these applications. And when you used to build your applications, you would actually go to the network team and say, I've put this network, you know, I put this server in place. Can you poke a hole in the firewall to get to my application, right? And we would go mm -hmm. and talk to the team. We would go to the database team and say, hey, Oracle team, can you provision me a database so I can put my data in it, right? And now we actually ask these individual kind of DevOps teams doing the development and the operations of the platform and because they're actually running it as well to do all of that, you know, build the infrastructure as code that's going to deploy the network, build the infrastructure as code that's going to deploy the database, build the infrastructure as code that's going to deploy the application. And because all of this is deployed that way, that one team is now doing all of the jobs that used to be these very different kind of siloed data center roles in, you know, often cloud, may not be in cloud, you could actually be deploying them in your data center that way. But the reality is, is that this whole transformation, we built applications differently. And I think because of that, 
you no longer have these very siloed expertise in every area. You have to have a bit of a generalist uh, approach to some of the ways that you do things. I don't know. What have you seen, Matt, you know, in uh, working with new modern applications? I, I uh, completely agree. When I was at Gartner, there was an analyst there who I absolutely adore, Earl Perkins. And he used <laughs> to describe it as, as a versatileist, you know, that you need individuals that know a, just enough about a large number of things to be able to do that. And, and he gave a, a discussion years ago about Internet of Things and the identity of those things. And it, and it really hit home. He goes, you know, these things have personalities. They try to do certain types of things and they've got different functions. And, and what I love about this particular imagery that comes across with, with this slide is it does highlight the transformational nature of our security, that we do have to look at different approaches to it, that, that what's above that line in kind of the proverbial old world is no longer effective. It doesn't have the fidelity or the assurance that you would need in kind of a new operating environment. So we have to do that kind of transformational side of it. And then we also have to look at it across a portfolio of applications, some that are legacy and some that are cloud native, and being able to see things across all areas. So I, I really like what this uh, what this is conveying. Yeah, it is. And it's, it, it does kind of have this kind of reinvention aspect to it as, as we do it. it it's, a, you know, what would any security presentation be without one of these silly charts with all these breaches <laughs> on it? But, um, it's interesting. I actually true, and I truly believe this, Matt, in cloud, using infrastructure as code and all these new mechanisms, we can be in a much better shape than we've been in the past, right? 100% agree. Build security in and all these things. There is this thing that happens in cloud, though, where because there's so many generalists building the applications um, or a team that's not familiar with cloud goes to build something in cloud, they may not be familiar with the cloud controls. And because of that, you end up with these scenarios of a small misconfiguration, you know, leading to these very large uh, breaches of data, right? Or, you know, there's so much trust in third party in cloud because it's so easy to set up you know, there's accidental kind of third party. We were talking about third party in the first part of this where that become becomes a risk. And it's interesting when we look through that, you know, why are some of those things, you know, one is that the, uh, the breaches are classically misconfiguration that leads to what is an identity that can get access to data, right? And that's a pretty common uh, pattern we see. One of the things in cloud, which I find so interesting is that um, you know, and again, I go back to my history, you know, we used to have five, five layers of firewalls before anything a developer did ever made it to the outside world. So there was nothing they could do to ever harm themselves. <laughs> right. Um, but now you have a scenario in cloud where everything is basically one step away from the, the outside world. And so the locks on the door, the defense in depth that we used to do has to be done differently. You have to lock the network door and you have to lock the identity door and you have to lock the encryption door. And if you lock all of the doors, hey, you have actually defense in depth, but you can't use the same control nested over and over like we used to um, in previous worlds. And so, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. The other thing that's really interesting in cloud, of course, is, is that you know, all of this great infrastructure as code as scale and these identity systems that are actually the true keys to these cloud systems, all of the workloads, the applications you build, the compute processes, um, the automation roles, the cloud services themselves all get identities by default, pretty much if you if you configure them this way. But of course, all of those identities have access to your data, depending on how they're configured. And if any of them become breached, the lateral movement gets really, really easy. And so we spend a lot of time talking about non-people identities and how, you know, when a when a machine gets popped, right, you know, through an API or, you know, a vulnerability or whatever the mechanism is, the first thing the attacker does is grab that, okay, well, what is this system running as from an identity and how can I use that identity to laterally move, right, um, within the environment? And, um, you know, we just see that as a pattern over and over and over again, uh, especially in these cloud breaches. Um, Again, you talked about IoT and the identities of the IoT things back from from Earl. I think, you know, I don't know if anybody realizes just yet how many of these identities they are. I don't you know, yeah. what's your yeah. take on that, Matt? It, it's, it's, um, um, it's effectively it's unknowable. unknowable. There's so There's much so out much there that's required, required to, be to be known. The identity, the, identity, the entitlements the identity. associated with it, 
it's it's inordinately problematic and it's not something that can be solved at kind of a human scale level and i think that's one of the the fascinating things when i saw this slide with the 40 percent in terms of overprivilege that's a really really critical area and then you think about you know the vast majority of, of these issues starting with a single identity but because of the entitlements if they're lucky if the adversary is fortunate enough um, to, to get an identity that has entitlements that are not necessarily commensurate to the function or the role or the service that's being provided, they're off to the races. And, yeah. and that's why we see, you know, unfortunately, the challenges that we see. But these cannot really be solved at a human scale level. And, and one of the things I do a lot of work around incident response. And, you know, anytime we're responding in a manual way to an automated adversary, we're effectively empowering the adversary to further compromise our environment. And we have to stop and, and you know think about these things and say, where do I automate? How do I systematize responses? How do I systematize evaluations of, of configurations and issues, especially around identities? Yeah, I for sure. And it's uh, you know, there's this great statistic that we have. So one of the things we do at Sunry is we're always um, dealing with all of the different privileges that get put in the cloud. So we monitor every permission that Amazon ads or Azure ads or GCP ads on any given day. And, you know, we've been at this long enough now that we can build statistics across it. And on average, we see 17 new permissions across those three clouds every single day. Um, yeah. It peaks at re-event, it peaks during, you know, insight and in different times of the year, you see these kind of bumps in it. But the reality is on average, every single day, 17 new permissions. And sometimes those are mundane things like, oh, I can describe a folder. Well, it doesn't really give you access to much other than the folder name. But sometimes there are things like create a pre-signed URL, which is literally poking a hole in your entire world to the outside world. And uh, so depending on how sensitive that permission is, you know, what state that you're in, um, you know, we look at, you actually brought this up, this is kind of the perfect lead into this slide, which is, you know, there are these interesting new attack vectors that show up um, through the way that we automate a bunch of our things. And so all of a sudden, if you get, I always like the, the concept of the Lambda function, the Lambda function you write to do exactly what it's going to do. You give it a set of permissions so that, you know, it can go and gather the data it needs out of the, the bucket or the DynamoDB table, or it needs to trigger the EC2 instance, whatever it is. So you've got the serverless function. But if you attach a policy to it that, you know, maybe is over permissive, because we're talking about over permissive, where it can read all of the data, and all of a sudden a developer can manipulate uh, that Lambda function, well, now you have the same problem that you've always had for years. If somebody steals the developer credential, now they can get the Lambda function to do something nefarious using the permissions that it has. And I think these non-people permissions, as we talk about, are everywhere in the cloud. And um, it's kind of fun to look at. I'll, I'll just build this out, Matt, and talk through it. But then we can have a conversation about you know all of these different parts because it's kind of neat. When you look at um, identities in cloud versus identities on prem, the old world looked a lot more like this. You had, you know, your IT admin, they had access to certain resources. You build an app, you had access to those resources. The clouds, though, added these kind of things. And this is a really good practice, by the way. They added these interesting, we'll call them non-person identities or non-people identities for the time being of mechanisms where you don't have to necessarily have static keys and credentials to access things anymore. So AWS has roles, you know, those credentials probably last six hours at a time and then get auto rotated um, in service principles. If you use them properly, you can do a very similar thing. And so these new mechanisms allow us to have these kind of dynamic credentials all the time, which is nice. You don't have access keys kicking around in places that they're not supposed to be. You still have the odd access key you got to hold. So you put that in a secret store, maybe use HashiCorp Vault or one of the cloud native things like a, a credential store or key vault or something. But you can also put them in there. Of course, if you have access to those secret stores, that gives you access to the keys, which gives you access to the data, right? And, uh, you know, of course, that could be anything from any other kind of serverless function or workload that you've built um, in doing that. You always have the concept of single sign-on. So, you know, you, your developers need to get in. And depending on if you're in the development account or the production account, what set of rights you're going to get. So you get single sign-on from different groups. I uh, We always joke we have a, an interesting kind of customer that at one point in time accidentally um, gave almost every employee in their company access to read everything in Azure because they were a nesting group so many levels deep, no one noticed that this one entitlement gave them, you know, basically every employee uh, access to the entire cloud. And so, you know, you have to be careful with your single sign on your groups because you can do some weird things there. 
And then of course, you know, you have things like cloud services that do things on your behalf as well. Think about an auto scaling group. It's telling something to auto scale. So it's provisioning new compute. It's doing these types of things. And so you have this um, very complex model of how DevOps Dave at one end may get access to a database or something at the other end. And this is where the clouds have also done a really beautiful thing. They've used identity like a firewall in that they allow you to actually put restrictions across this whole environment using global policies and Amazon calls theirs SCPs, but it doesn't matter. But basically these controls that say, you know, if you don't do the right thing, you didn't use MFA, we're not going to let you do uh, permission X. You know what? If you're in this particular area, we're not going to allow you to modify the network settings in the area, no matter what. And so they've used identity as a way to control this whole model as well. And then you take this and multiply it by thousands of cloud accounts that you have. It's a very complex model of identity. And, um, you know, I don't think I have customers that started in the world where they were mapping this stuff out on paper, <laughs> trying to figure out what those uh, the breach and the blast radius was for all this stuff. Um, but it is certainly a complex problem that uh, everyone needs to be aware of. But there's some great controls in here, too, Matt. And I really think this is how, you know, using all of these controls we do away with some long-term credentials. We actually put great protections in place and actually get our arms around this as long as it's done right. So you're working with different people that are kind of thinking that way now? Yeah, I, I think for those that are building kind of cloud native applications, they understand this and they understand it, generally speaking, relatively well. But, but your point just on the Azure uh, misconfiguration, fundamentally, it's almost an unknowable at a manual or human side configuration um, error or a control error, if you will, because each one of these services has n number of configurations and settings, and those connect to any number of other services and settings and configurations and identities. And before too long, the numbers there are just at, you know extreme. And even in a relatively small VPC, you, you really don't have the luxury of being able to go in and kind of do a manual review of these activities. It has to be done systemically. So, yeah, and, and I agree, Sandy. I, I think, you know, I gave a talk. This is probably in 2012 or 13 that security is enhanced in the cloud and, and you would end up having to defend not being in a kind of cloud security type of environment just because of some of the native tools. The fact that you can do kind of a, ephemeral tokens and things of that nature that are very short lived and contextually tied, I think is extraordinarily powerful. If you're using the services and, and capabilities and applications correctly, which is an enormous if. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it, but it, you see customers, come, some customers doing it very well, actually. It's, uh, you know, and then you see some other ones that are kind of a bit of a mess, but it's, uh, you know, if it is, it does give you all those controls. And as you say, if you're doing systematic, you know, mapping of this, you really can find those kind of weak points and, and shore them up quite quickly um, within the environment. Um, you know, it, it's interesting here. We're, we're not necessarily here to just kind of say, here's all the bad things, right? We're going to talk about some, some good things, but I always like to talk about uh, privilege escalation and, and privilege escalation in cloud um, is something that's, you know, has some unique scenarios to it that we haven't thought about on prem probably in a, in a while. Um, and so it's fun to go through each one of these and I'll give examples of them as I, as I go through. And again, I, I've been a security guy for 20 years, you know, lots of penetration testing, lots of red teaming, lots of those types of things. And so privilege escalation is obviously something that, uh, whatever close to my heart in terms of, uh, you know, how you get from A to B. Um, but in cloud, these are the things that we always tell people to worry about. And they can kind of be categorized into five things. One is, you know, you never want to have scenarios, at least in a regulated environment or a sensitive environment where direct self-escalation is possible, right? You know, you don't want to give an identity, doesn't matter if it's a non-human identity or human identity, the ability to modify its own rights. Um, you know, anytime you do that, you end up with a problem where it's very easy to take something that's at a low permission, you know, assign it higher permission and get there. And so that's just a no-no. We know that one. It's pretty obvious. In, uh, in cloud, there's a lot of indirect escalation scenarios too. So this is where maybe you can modify some other identities credentials. So you've done proper separation of duties, 
Um, but then it becomes very easy for you to impersonate the other identity. And um, there's a lot of scenarios where you can do these types of things by, you know, be able to, if you can modify a role's policy or trust relationship with something that you have, then you can actually get access to that role and do something with it. So indirect escalations are, are certainly something you have to be very careful of when you do them. Um, unintended inheritance, back to that Azure problem we talked about where everybody ended up with read access to all of Azure um, in their environment. This is another one that you have to worry about um, that's very different than enterprise. So in big data centers, um, if you build an application and it had a database server in it and you wanted you know, your main active directory to be the main authentication mechanism for that database server, you intentionally configured that on the database server. So you went to the database server, you wired it up to the active directory, you figured out how you were going to do your um, attribute based controls and things that you were going to do and you set that up and it was very intentional. In cloud, there's a lot of scenarios that when you were given a permission, like you have, you know, reader permission at a level, you inherit the ability to read everything below that. And so now all of a sudden, maybe you have reader at a management group level. Well, that gives you the ability to read the subscription and gives you the ability to read the management group and gives you the ability to read the database inside of it. And it's a, not really intended that, oh, well, this DevOps engineer or somebody that was going to have this kind of level of read access, which we thought was kind of safe, we didn't assume they'd be able to read the customer database that was sitting several layers below that. And uh, so you have to be careful with unintended inheritance in cloud that there's many forms of it, but it all has to do with this kind of accidental, um, non-intentional access. So those are ones that we've talked about in enterprise for years. Yeah, I was um, gonna say on the unintended to what on your a couple of slides back, all the S, S3 uh, challenges. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's it, it's, it, it's at the heart of it. It's like somebody yeah. didn't configure something correctly and didn't understand what the permutations are of, of not having that particular setting locked down. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, you know, some of those are the public ones, which are, are you know, a, a resource policy. Some of them, though, are actually like, OK, well, you were on an EC2 instance because of a vulnerability and the EC2 instance has S3 read object but nobody constrained it to what S3 bucket. So all of the S3 buckets become readable by that object, right? And so that is definitely an unintended configuration that, that gave more access. And, uh, you know, these are ones where, where again, they're, they're easy enough to understand and we know how to lock them. These next two get really interesting though. So there's this concept of what's called a confused deputy. I think Rhino security may have even invented that word. I don't know. Um, but what this is interesting is that you have some identity with a lower level of permission that gets access to a resource. Maybe that's an EC2 instance, maybe that's a SageMaker notebook, maybe that's something else. But then that resource, whatever you have access to now, the serverless function, the VM, the container, the SageMaker machine analytics notebook, it has a higher level of permission. And depending on how the controls are set up, that lower level identity now can basically use any of those higher level permissions that that thing has. And you see this kind of, you know, confused deputy type of problem a lot, and it can be triggered across, you know, API gateways and all kinds of things within the cloud. And you have to be very careful of it. Um, and it, you see it a lot in combinations where you have in a single account kind of this ability to um, get access to resources. It uh, was very surprising to me early on that many of the cloud providers um, put management agents on their VMs, which I guess makes sense. Why wouldn't they? They want to collect metrics and things off them. But those agents often run at a very high level of privilege. And if you have access to those agents in that account, you often can get those VMs to do things they're not supposed to. And if they're running with high levels of credentials, you can then abuse that, that uh, path. Um, so it's a good process to have the, the, the agent, but you had to make sure that the identities are locked down that can get access to it. So those are confused deputy ones. There's also this other one, and this is one that is truly kind of interesting in cloud and something that in my head, I probably had never thought of. So think about this, you're an attacker, you've, you've somehow managed to get into this account, um, you feel like, oh, I'm going to ransomware this or whatever nefarious thing you're going to do. And you discover that, oh, I can read the data, but I can't delete it. I can't destroy it. I can't do whatever. And you magically discover through whatever kind of path that you fit, you, you do get to manage lifecycle policies, which you think of, okay, well, I managed to get on this app. The app was managing its own lifecycle policies. Maybe every 14 days it uh, releases the data or removes it. Well, if you can change the resource 
in this case, the life cycle policy, and it's not just life cycle policies, there's all kinds of examples of this, but you can change the resources life cycle policy. You can set the resource life cycle policy to zero, in which case it will just remove all of its data, right? And so now all of a sudden, you know, if you could read the data off first, move it somewhere that you have access to it, life cycle the data out and now the data is gone now you can you know of course hold it hostage or whatever you want to do and um so there's all these interesting permissions that are maybe didn't seem so sensitive that you were giving the workload because that well it has to manage its own data that's what it's supposed to do but now you realize that that can be used against you right and so these are some interesting patterns of of privilege escalation in cloud and always things that we just want to keep keep track of we usually spend a lot of time kind of helping customers figure out, you know, how do you remove these things uh, from your cloud when you have them? So it, it speaks to why we should be doing stride and threat models. Yeah. <laughs> what, yes. what is it that I don't know that I should know and how could it impact this particular application and its settings? And and uh, I, I remember we had in our ISACA chapter here in San Diego, we, we did a uh, uh, kind of a pen testing training session and the folks that came out and conducted it showed we're going to use Lambda functions to lock the account out from a budget perspective. And they, they were able to reinstantiate a Lambda function with a certain cadence. And in relatively short order, they kind of showed the financial implications of it and boom, locked it out. And, and I think I, I love this slide. I think it, it really highlights things that are not knowable at first, but are absolutely knowable if you take pause and just ask the basic questions. How would I spoof the identity? How would I tamper with the environment? How would I repudiate transactions? What would be required to have information disclosure, deny services, and of course, elevate privileges? And then what are those conditions precedent, precedent that are required to do that? And can we block it? <laughs> yeah. We should actually do a fun, someday we'll do this, Matt. We'll do like five of these charts, right? And say, okay, what are the five for this one and the five for that one and the five for that one? Because there's yep. the uh, denial of service one that you taught. It's just insane the number of things you can do to mess up cloud accounts in that world because they, as you say, they bump into their limits quite easily in many areas if they're not configured to uh, to do that. And if you uh, have somebody running amok, you can chew up the resources pretty quick. Exactly. Um, Look, I again, we don't, we're not here about. We want to help people and say, how do you, you know, how do you make this thing better, right? And uh, you know, what can you do to to help it? And so, I've got a bunch of different kind of things I usually help customers with. That I, uh, I say, look, if you take one thing out of this session, go do this one thing, right? And um, so we've got a few examples on the next slide, uh, Matt, that we'll talk about as we as we go through here. But I think, you know, from everybody that's that's listening in and. Uh, if you have other ideas, you know, you can throw them in the chat. I think there's a chat here, Matt, that people can can add to. We'd, we'd love to hear other ideas as well. Um, so, and again, we're only focused on identity today. We could be focused on data. We could be focused on computer workloads, all kinds of stuff. We're talking about identity. So, you know, there's there's kind of five things I always say, you know, these are the ones where you can start and make a, make a pretty good impact, right? Um, the first one is all around your break glass identities. People have different words for break glass. Sometimes it's fire call, whichever. But, you know, <laughs> DevOps engineer, 2 a.m. in the morning, problem going wrong. How do they get in, right? Um, you have to manage those very carefully. Um, they're required. You need them. Um, you know, I always say you can do automated least privilege in an account. And the first thing it does is it wants to remove all of your, your break glass accounts because they're not used. And they shouldn't be most of the time. But when they are, you know, you need to have the right mechanisms around them. Some of this stuff gets a little complicated in cloud where if you're trying to do, you know, true kind of separation of duties and stuff, you may need a couple of keys to turn somewhere to get some of these things to open up. So you got to have a good management process around that um, so that your ops guys aren't running around with, you know, full privilege every day. That's one. Um, and we've seen some some bad scenarios where that's not true, right? You know, especially if a credential is ever, ever compromised. The next one is all about the team and the process. And uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, in cloud, you know, we've done identity certifications for years. So if you walk into any large enterprise, Matt, you know this, right? You know, you got to certify, you know, Joe's uh, rights to have access to the sensitive data every six months, or whatever it is. Um, I used to laugh when I was at IBM. I would get these massive emails with all the all the people that I managed that I had to basically certify they still had access to email for six months or whatever it was. And uh, you know, you would go through that process. There's a whole bunch of those non-people identities that the teams that build them probably should be certifying on a regular basis as well, because they have a tendency to leave them around and never remove them when they're upgrading their workloads every you know sprint, 
Um, and so that's something to keep in mind, you know, who's taking care of those and certifying them and, you know, ultimately removing them if they're no longer in use. Um, I, I think that middle top and that bottom left are so inextricably linked. It's it's just yes. absolutely foundational. You, you have to have a routine process to validate the status. And then you've got to have a, a defined policy that ideally is orchestrated into your your credential management and entitlement process where these accounts that uh, the way I look at them is kind of orphaned. You know, why in the world was this particular permission, whether it's a personal identity or a system identity, why does it have that status? And in those discussions, when things go bad, can get nasty very quickly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sandy, why in the world was this uh, sysadmin account with no MFA not reviewed in the last 90 days, uh, you know. Or, right, you know, you thought, you know, you used the word sysadmin again. I always go back to the workload ones, right? You know, two years ago, we had an application that did whatever. We have upgraded it five times. We've redeployed it. We've done all of these things. And yet the original identity that was configured for it all that time ago is still sitting there with a bunch of, you know, trust relationships still hooked up to something, right? And if somebody can get access to that, they can do all kinds of things with it. Um, the process is important, though, actually, again, when you talk about these two being linked, um, you know, kill dormant identities, it seems so simple. You look at it and you're like, oh, well, of course we would do that. Why wouldn't we do that? But then you're in a scenario where you're building applications with really strong separation of duties. And you realize that the app team may have to ask for the identity the app's going to use a month in advance to get it provisioned and put in the cloud and all the things before they can build the app properly on top of it. And if that's the case, it may sit there for two weeks before it ever lights up the first time. And uh, so you have to, the process is so important and uh, to know why these things are there and who's, as you say, certifying them is is key in, in all that. So anyway, certainly something that, you know, you can literally, if all you do go back today is go back and look at your identities and figure out which ones are not used and figure out, you know, if they haven't been used in three years, start uh, start removing them. Same thing with access keys that haven't been rotated that long. It's, that it's interesting because here in California, we have the California Consumer Privacy Act, which will in 2023 become the California Privacy Rights Act. And it describes, uh, quote unquote, reasonable security or Article 25 of the GDPR talks about security by design and by default. When these conditions are not met, in other words, you're not proactively disabling or deprecating accounts that no longer have a, a viable reason. You could see in a really litigious environment, which is what we live in, that that gets nasty quickly. You know, why wasn't this account disabled? What do you mean you don't have a process not to review accounts in a timely basis? And, and you see a lot of this in like SOC 2 audit reports where a company didn't disable credentials in a timely fashion, but start thinking about the permutations in that penultimate slide where you had all the the various services and number of configurations, it has to be done systemically. Yeah, it, it does. And it's, uh, you know, the auditors are starting to catch up with this. It's, uh, yeah. you know, I, even three years ago, the chances that an auditor would ask anything about an AWS role was non-existent, right? They weren't going to ask for that in the evidence. Um, but some of them are getting smarter now. They know enough to do it. If you're an AWS shop, they're going to start to ask for, okay, well, give me the list of roles that they're in the account and when they were used, you know, you can get that out of their, these reports. So, um, it's, uh, it's coming for people that are using cloud, the auditors will catch up. Um, the other one that's kind of interesting, you know, obviously Sunry does this as a function, but the cloud providers have their own little ways of doing it as well, um, to some extent. So everyone can try this at least. Um, you know, getting the least privilege, right? You know, there's there are ways to look at a role or a user or a policy or an entitlement and say, you know, did we over permission this? Did, you know, does the identity have full, you know, admin rights, but they only ever describe resources. They don't ever actually configure them. Well, then why are we giving them so many rights if that's the case? Um, and like I say, there's different levels of tool, tools that do that at different um, kind of granularity. Um, but you can do something in that area today. And then again, most of the systems um, or systems you can put on top do a lot of stuff to look for behavioral anomalies as well. You know, those are always the ones where sometimes it's truly an anomaly because somebody, you know, all of a sudden started working from home and they'd never done that before. Um, but if they show up in a different country tomorrow, somebody probably <laughs> should into that. And uh, so, you know, you have those, those scenarios um, that you can kind of do right away. And it makes a big difference, as you say, you know, in the in the environment we're walking into, you know, those credentials need to be checked very carefully on a, on yep. a very basis. So, 
some good stuff there. Um, look, I always say again too, we we always want to get to an operational state of this stuff. Doing it one time doesn't uh, doesn't cut it. You got to be able to do it continuously and do it over and over and over again. But you got to also have realistic goals. I um, again in my twenty years of doing this and working across the globe, I often ran into places where, you know, somebody would say please, can we turn on the most amazing machine learning anomaly detection, whatever, we want to see all the results from it. And I would ask them very simple questions, Matt, like, but have you salted the passwords? And <laughs> no, and you would be like, okay, well, you don't need to start there. You need to start way back at the start, right? And so we always tell people like, you can't start at zero trust, right? You have to work your way to that point, you know, get rid of the old identities that aren't used first before you're worrying about cutting off everybody that has access as access um, on that side. And I think that's a that's a good, good lesson for everybody, right? You just have to walk, start, walk, run, start at basic, work your way up uh, to these controls. Don't don't do it all in one day um, on that side. The, um, the next one, Matt, the, the second point is something that I just truly believe in. It goes back to that very first slide we looked at. Those that build the applications fix the applications. Um, security for so many years, we sent everything to the SOC. And that's great. The problem with it is, of course, the SOC is not prepared to understand your application. You know, the, the team that built the application knows it very well. And so if you all of a sudden send, you know, let's talk about a whole bunch of, you know, cloud configuration issues to the SOC, they actually don't know what to do with them and they don't know why they're configured that way. But the application development teams do. And so you have to bring those teams into the process and have them fixing it. And it kind of becomes distributed security at that time. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously there has to be escalation paths. You know, you can't let the developers sign off on, you know, blatant issues. Um, but they can actually give a lot of context into this process. And that first triage of a lot of problems could be done by those teams. Um, you know, again, the just enough privilege is, is, a, is a great thing to monitor towards and work towards um, and really kind of empowering the teams to uh, this is where we always say, like, you need to give the developers a lot of rope. You know, they need to be able to experiment. They need to be able to build new environments. They need to be able to have star permissions in the account when they're in that experimental phase. But when you get really sensitive data, the most critical data in the production environment, that's no longer acceptable. And now you have to lock it down, but you need to enable both of those, those mechanisms. And so, you know, building an environment where you can let, you know, these new modern application developers build and experiment and do that is, is important. They love it. It just makes them more productive. But then in certain areas, you've got to really lock this stuff down and build that control. And that's again, what we've tried to do. I know Matt, you're probably a proponent of that as well. Cause again, you, you want innovation, right? You don't want to kill innovation by putting security in place. So. Yeah, I, th I think it's all about appropriate guardrails, but where the guardrails are fundamentally built into the, the architecture. And, and Matt Schufeld, one of my colleagues here, when you look at zero trust, the, the wording gets overused a lot. But really what it is, is fundamentally a series of architectural decisions. And, and if you can instrument that in, but do it well and thoughtfully, where you're not slowing down innovation, you're not slowing down development, you're not slowing things down in any way, shape or form, but the guardrails are there, even if the individual or the systems in many cases don't know the guardrails are there, that's kind of the ideal state. You're, you've got flow, you're moving quickly, things are getting accomplished and done, but you're not presenting existential risk to the organization. Yeah, exactly. Look, Matt, I think that kind of wraps us back to the, the question point uh, here, and hopefully the audience has some questions uh, for us. I think they can do that through the, the q and I'm going to stop sharing if that works. We will see here in a second if it does. Yeah, absolutely. In the uh, chat, people can certainly uh, posit uh, comments and questions and, and other things that they would like as well. I know there's a, a couple of things, just more maybe uh, a couple of moments, Sandy, about some of the things that Sunray is doing um, as it relates to helping organizations manage these, these identity issues. Uh, we're, we're multipolar or not even bipolar, uh, <laughs> but managing these things at, at scale. Would love to get your, your quick insights on that. Look, it's it's interesting. You said early on you can't uh, you can't manually do this. There's no way to do it. And so Sunray builds this interesting graph across all of your cloud accounts, um, across all the public clouds, and maps all of the identities to the compute to the roles they can assume, and that role can assume another. Can, it gets access to this resource, 
And then we build analytics across that to find the weak spots in those, or, you know, in scenarios, sometimes we just do it from reverse, find me the most sensitive data. And we will just tell you every identity that can get there through any crazy red teaming exercise that you, that yeah. you run. And we use that to build least privileged policies and all kinds of great things. But again, we also, it's interesting. That's the vision of the company. So you think, oh, that's amazing. But then you work with customers and you realize not all customers are at that level yet. They're still struggling with basic configuration problems. They're still struggling with, you know, how do I do, um, you know, least privilege in this account? How do I actually stop giving the build role star, <laughs> which it yeah. just happens way too often? Um, you know, the developer said they didn't know what they were going to do tomorrow. So they gave it star and that's acceptable. Well, not really, actually. <laughs> but um, so we have this kind of concept where we take all of the different workloads, all of the different environments, and we kind of give them a maturity score. And we say, look, if it's a sandbox innovation, it just has to have the okay. basic security controls, right? We just make it, here are the guardrails, you'll follow those, but otherwise you can have as much rope as you want. But then you have an area of your environment that's highly sensitive and it has your most sensitive data in it. Well, in there, we're going to measure you to a much higher level of maturity and you better be at an advanced level or, you know, a resilient level of security or zero trust if you want to get to that level um, of security, but only in that small area. We're not going to judge your entire environment as that. And you know, we do a lot of stuff around cloud posture and configuration, all those things. Um, and everybody's on a different part of their journey in terms of innovation and, and transformation to the cloud. So we help with all of that as we do it. So it's a really fun thing, Matt. I uh, I have to say it's been a it's been a great three or four years here working all feet in the future, everything in cloud. So it's it's a lot of fun. I would love it sounds amazing. What what if if you were to point to maybe one or two epiphanies, things that just kind of like blew your mind when you started this effort and you kind of started heading down this path what would those be look i uh matt my and again the things that you think versus reality are two different things <laughs> we started this company you could tell from the name sunry it was going to be a data security company we were all about data because we made this assumption that everyone had cloud security under control they would have figured out all of this stuff config and identity and all this stuff but we knew that the old ways of doing data security you couldn't put an agent on the database if Amazon has the box, it's they're not gonna let you put an agent on it. So you can't do that anymore. You can't put a proxy in front of it because it messes up your elastic scalability stuff. You need a different way to track data. And uh, so that was the, hey, this is gonna be amazing. And then we arrived in cloud and discovered that, well, everybody's configuration's a mess. Nobody understands this identity stuff. And we actually had built this beautiful model, this graph to access all of, everything that has access to your data. And so we really took the company and changed it because that's not where people were today. Yeah, data security is important in cloud, but people aren't even there yet in many cases. And so we uh, we really had to think about what the problem of the day was in, in solving that from the, the cloud configuration, the cloud posture, the cloud identity, and how to, how to understand that. Um, the other epiphany I have is that too many people, you know, it just seems like a brilliant idea and it sounds fine on paper. Let's just do a CIS benchmark across our whole cloud. That seems like a good idea. But the problem is when you do that and you have a thousand cloud accounts, there is this very different world. A sandbox account where somebody's experimenting, you know what, if you don't have uh, encryption turned on in an S3 bucket, it's not really that important. There's no sensitive data there. It doesn't really matter. But if it's your most sensitive workload in your cloud, it really does. And so you can't just take this kind of standard benchmark and say, I'm just going to do this across my whole cloud. It doesn't make sense to do that. You have to divide it up. You have to be able to distribute the teams. You have to be able to give the work to the right teams. There's a huge part of this that it just isn't solved by, you know, technology and finding things and analytics. It's it's a workflow. It's a process. It's it's putting that stuff in place. So you know. it, it, it all boils down to crawl. Walk. Yeah, walk. Right. Right. Exactly. yeah. And, and right now in security, there's a lot of crawling still. <laughs> yeah. For, for better or worse, um, this this was just absolutely a fantastic discussion, Sandy. I've I've thoroughly have enjoyed this and in, in kind of the 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 planning sessions and and again as a note of when we had our at the beginning of our summit and trying to frame this, I do think we're in this really interesting transitional phase with respect to a lot of our secure architecture. Um, the older tools that we've historically used don't address some of the risks that organizations confront today. And, and to the extent that we don't kind of make those adjustments and, and think about what type of tooling we need, where it would be deployed, what is it that we don't see that we should see, and how do I get that visibility, we're going to continue to see the uh, issues that we saw on your one uh, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, kind of the, the S3 bucket <laughs> slide. <laughs>
<laughs> so this this was just absolutely stellar and, and thoroughly enjoyed the time today. Thank you. You too, Matt. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Thanks Excellent. for joining. Thank you, everyone, for joining.